Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is November 30, 1980, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 60. Four days ago the New York Daily News published an interesting article about a coming motion picture. It's called The Formula and deals with an international oil conspiracy. And even before seeing the picture, Mobile Oil is reported to be acting very nervous. Supposedly, Mobile is threatening to sue the movie maker MGM if Mobile is mentioned in any way. Somehow the whole situation seems to symbolize our situation today. The movie is about oil companies hiding the truth, and at least one real-life oil company would apparently like to hide the movie. Big Oil always operates behind a wall of secrecy, deception, and stealth. And in the election just passed, Big Oil has succeeded for the moment in its grab for the White House, and so a temporary change of style is brewing in American politics. The Bolsheviks who have been in power favor active propaganda to mislead us. By contrast, Big Oil generally prefers to tell us nothing at all. So as the so-called Reagan Administration takes over, we will tend to have a say-nothing government for a while. But whether our government is controlled behind the scenes by Big Oil or by the Bolsheviks, you and I lose, because they all operate in the dark where they cannot be watched. We are living in an age of stealth and it is leading toward disaster for us all. My three topics this month are Topic No. 1, The Great Election Surprise of 1980. Topic No. 2, The Planned Collapse of America's Banking System. And Topic No. 3, The New Age of Warfare by Stealth. Topic No. 1. For weeks now Washington has been buzzing about the great election surprise of 1980. Right up to the last minute all the opinion polls were saying the same thing, too close to call. But when the television networks began their election night coverage, they told a radically different story. Fifteen minutes after the polls closed on the East Coast, NBC declared the entity Ronald Reagan the winner. On the West Coast, polls were still open, but voters began drifting away. Even more shocking, the alleged President Carter himself conceded defeat less than two hours later. West Coast polls still had an hour to go at that point, but many remaining voters just gave up. By then it was fast becoming clear that voting machines nationwide had registered a landslide in the name of Ronald Reagan. It was an unprecedented state of affairs. The Republican landslide apparently was enormous, and yet we are told it was a complete surprise. On all sides political analysts are still rubbing their eyes in disbelief. They're trying out all kinds of excuses to explain why the polls were wrong. Maybe the pocketbook issue did it, they say. Or maybe all those undecided voters before the election were really closet conservatives. Or then again, maybe it was just a plain old protest vote. Or would you believe it was Billy Carter, maybe? My friends, last month I reported that there was one issue that could help defeat the present Bolshevik Administration. That was the breakdown of the hostage release ploy just before the election. And it may be that many voters were affected in that way that I mentioned last month, but the apparently surprise landslide was brought about by entirely different means. My friends, it was not the opinion polls that were wrong this time. It was the tally of votes on Election Day. To bring home what I am about to tell you, I would like to tell you a personal story. It's a story of my own race for the governorship of my home state of West Virginia twelve years ago. The idea that I run for Governor came from a political leader in West Virginia. I was then in my sixth year as legal counsel to the United States Export-Import Bank here in Washington. I had been appointed to that position in 1961 by President Kennedy, 
and apparently there were those who remembered my efforts in helping Kennedy win in West Virginia in 1960. In any case, I decided to accept the uh, suggestion. On May 1, 1967, I resigned from the Export-Import Bank and returned to my native state of West Virginia. For the next year I carried out an exhausting grassroots campaign throughout the state. My wife Lily and I went everywhere and spoke to everyone, or so it seemed. There was not a county we missed, and there was hardly a hand that I had not pressed. And from every indication my campaign was going very well. Then one night, two weeks before the election, the telephone rang. When I picked up the telephone, a voice said, This is so-and-so. I asked what I could do for him, and he replied, Well, you'd like to have your votes counted, wouldn't you? Still half asleep, I said, Of course. What are you talking about? His answer was, Well, you know politics is a business. You'd like to have your votes counted, wouldn't you? By that time I was wide awake. I replied that there were plenty of county officials and precinct workers to take care of the vote counting. Then I asked him what he was driving at. He said, Well, in those precincts which have machines, you have to make sure your votes are counted. Don't you understand? This is just how it's done. If you want your votes counted, it'll cost you $250,000. I was flabbergasted, but said I would not pay a cent. I didn't do things like that. At that point the caller said, Well, it looks like we can't do any business then, and hung up. After putting the telephone down I just sat there astonished. My wife Lily said, What was that? And I told her, We just lost the election. My friends, in the counties and precincts where old-fashioned paper ballots were used, I did receive votes, but without exception. In every location where voting machines were used, I received no votes, not one single vote. That seemed incredible to me at the time, but I had no evidence, nothing but a telephone call which I could not prove. Then about two weeks after the election, I received a phone call from a Baptist minister. He was asking to meet me because something important had come to his attention, so the next day I met the minister in a town near Beckley, West Virginia. He had another man with him. The good minister told me that the man with him had asked him, the minister, to forgive him for something he had done to me. The minister had replied that it was not up to him to forgive the man, but up to Mr. Beter. So I asked the minister's friend what it was that he had done to me, and he said, Mr. Beter, I fixed the voting machines against you. Then he blurted out the whole thing. He said that he was known as a repairman for these machines, but he explained that when he went to the factory school in another state, he was also taught other things. He was taught how to adjust the machinery to record whatever is wanted. For example, voters who pulled the lever for me thought that they were voting for me, but inside the machine the machine was adjusted to transfer the vote to another pre-selected candidate. I could hardly believe my ears. Over a year of grass rooting the state down the drain, and all because of a specialized slot machine known as a voting machine. I asked him why he did such a thing. He answered, For the money, Mr. Beter, I really need the money. Then he added that he was not the only one, that there were others all over the country doing the same thing. Then he broke down and cried. He said he wanted me to know and to decide if I wanted to forgive him. Really I felt no revenge, only sorrow for him, and I knew what poverty could do to a person. By this time all three of us were in tears. I placed my hand on his shoulder and said, that I did forgive him. Later I went to the frauds section of the United States Department of Justice here in Washington. They told me that a governor's race was merely a local matter, so the Federal Government could not investigate. I also looked into other avenues for possible redress through the courts. But throughout the United States there have been many cases taken to court over election rigging, 
and in the end the courts always do nothing. So ended my governorship race in West Virginia in 1968. I learned the hard way that politics has become a business. In every Presidential election since voting machines have been used, there have been charges of voting fraud in certain states. Sometimes more votes are counted than there are registered voters. There are people nicknamed the Lever Brothers in West Virginia who go around and pull the levers before the actual voting begins. There are others who tamper with the machines in their warehouses before they are delivered to the polling places, and there are corrupt officials who know all these things but keep their mouths shut for fear or for money. In AUDIO LETTER No. 1 I reviewed some of the background of voting machines. My friends, this is very important. Voting machines are not regulated in any way. They were developed from slot machines, and they were controlled at first by organized crime, but then, long ago, they were absorbed into the hands of the Rockefeller Cartel, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 1. And in the secret struggle over the election which I reported last month, voting machines were the decisive secret weapon. For the moment they have carried the day for the Rockefeller Oil Cartel. As the voting began on November 4, 1980, the entity President Carter was in Plains, Georgia to vote. Reporters on the scene said later that he almost broke down and cried as he spoke to townspeople, because the outcome was already known before the voting began. That is also the reason for the unprecedented concession an hour before West Coast polls closed. Word had reached the White House only the day before about what was going to happen. There was massive fixing of voting machines in nine states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida. Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Texas, and California. The machines were also fixed, but on a less complete scale in Indiana and Missouri. In addition, there was selective fixing of machines in key districts of more than 20 other states. It was all over before it started. The opinion polls beforehand were actually far more accurate than the voting tallies on Election Day. Opinion polls can be fixed too, but in this case they were not. All the polls found a general apathy about the candidates, dissatisfaction with all of them, and that apathy was reflected by the low turnout on Election Day. In spite of good weather nationwide, the turnout was the lowest in 30 years. That spells apathy, my friends, and apathy does not create landslides. Instead, apathy about candidates leads to a flip-the-coin attitude. Heads, it is Candidate A. Tails, it's Candidate B. Both candidates, or in this case, both major candidates just about split the vote. So apathy leads to a very close race just as the polls predicted. But thanks to fixable voting machines, a landslide was created out of thin air. Last month I reported some of the factors pointing to a last-minute election surprise. As I explained then, it's a mild setback for the Bolsheviks here. Right now Big Oil is preparing to run the country with a free hand. The figurehead called Reagan is being programmed to behave like a new Eisenhower, delegating everything to agents of big oil. But the Bolsheviks here are working fast. They're in a hurry to seize control of the so-called Reagan team themselves. Once that happens, the so-called Reagan era may end abruptly. The Reagan image is tailored to fit the corporate socialist plans of big oil. So the Bolsheviks will prefer a new face, a new figurehead, to program their own way. And so, someday sooner than you think, we Americans may be in for a shock. 
we will be told that the entity President Reagan has met with an unfortunate accident or a sudden fatal illness. Then we will be seeing a new face saying new things. The face will seem to be that of George Bush speaking from Washington, but his words will come straight from Bolshevik headquarters in New York City, and that, my friends, will be the last and greatest surprise in the stolen election of 1980. Topic No. 2. Last month I gave you suggestions for an awful lot to do. I offered you not one but two major steps in our action plan to save America. Action Step 4, you will recall, involves another letter to Senator William Proxmire, and it's the most important so far in spite of the election results, because this Proxmire letter is an important weapon as we open up the second front in our battle. In Action Step 5, I outlined how we can do this. We're going to the very heart of America's banking system, the privately owned Federal Reserve System. This month, my friends, I want to give you a breather. It's vitally important that you follow through on the things I suggested last month, so I want to make sure that you have enough time to do all those things. The letters which I have urged you to write to the Federal Reserve System are more important than you can imagine, so in spite of the holidays, I ask you please write those letters as soon as possible. Nothing less than our survival as a nation is at stake. Let me mention one footnote to my suggestions of last month. If you should have any trouble getting the names of the Federal Reserve officials from your bank, don't give up. You can call the Federal Reserve Bank in your region and ask for the library. Ask the librarian for the names of the President, the officers, and all the directors. Several listeners have already done this and got the names without any difficulty. Beyond this, I would make no new suggestions for what you can do this month, but I do want to take a few moments to remind you where we are heading if we do not act. We are once again watching interest rates explode like bombs on the American economy, and on all sides we're hearing about the disastrous effects which are coming in automobiles, construction, and business in general. Already it appears that Chrysler might go under, and when financial analysts mention this, they say in the same breath a forbidden word, depression. But my friends, interest rates are not the only way in which America's major banks are leading us into a depression with inflation. America's banking system itself is becoming shakier by the day. The seeds of trouble have been there for many years now. They are all related to the grand design to destroy our money and our economy. It's the same grand design which involved the theft of America's monetary gold supply, but the process began speeding up nearly two years ago in early 1979. That was when the Bolsheviks here staged their hidden coup d'etat against the Rockefellers. In AUDIO LETTER No. 44 from March 1979, I gave my listeners an early warning about this process. I explained how the stage was being set for a collapse of America's entire banking system, and I revealed that the failure of the giant Chase Manhattan Bank may well trigger it all. For various reasons, many people considered my warning about the banks just too incredible to believe at that time. But just like the coming nuclear war, the coming bank collapse is now coming closer to the surface, and as it does so, danger signals are inevitably showing up here and there. For example, Fortune magazine recently said, and I quote, there can be no doubt that banking is entering a period of crisis. In one way or another, the industry's troubles could lead to the passing of many banks, perhaps including some of the biggest and most prestigious." Unquote. And four months ago, at the end of July 1980, the Christian Science Monitor carried two Page 1 reports about the situation. 
They focused attention on the disastrous new act which I told you about last month, the so-called Monetary Control Act of 1980. It pointed out that the Act has drastically reduced the ratio of insurance reserves to savings. There is now only about a penny to back up every dollar you have in a bank or savings and loan savings account. The collapse of just a few large banks could wipe out the whole savings insurance system. And if that happens, my friends, collapsing confidence will bring down America's entire banking system. The second special article in the Monitor contained a hint at something even more basic. It said, quote, The sleeper monetary provisions of the Act continue to nag at gold and precious metals-oriented conservatives. They see the danger that the Fed, an administration facing a possible bank crash at some point, might throw the doors open to hyperinflation of the United States economy." Unquote. My friends, those are exactly the stakes I was warning you about last month. There is no goal to back up the Federal Reserve IOUs which we use as money. The Federal Reserve System is claiming assets which do not exist. Those who have conspired to destroy our money have planned all along to bring on a bank crash. They want the banks to collapse when the time is right, but they don't want you to know what is happening. They dare not let you know the truth about our missing gold. And so certain key Treasury and Federal Reserve officials are meeting right now to plan a counterattack against our preventive war of truth. As always, their plan is to use the big lie, and as you know, they were liars from the beginning, and they are liars now. It is a lie, my friends, that the Treasury today holds 270 million ounces of Federal Reserve gold in its vaults. That's what Treasury and Federal Reserve books show, but those books are a complete fraud, a lie, and more and more people are having doubts about it. But there is an old psychological trick that is about to be used on us all. That trick is if people start to suspect a lie, make the lie even bigger. Most people are taken completely off guard by this technique. If a lie becomes big enough, people think it has to be the truth. No one, we think, would have enough nerve to tell a lie that big. So here is a trick that is now being planned. Right now our gold reserves are officially valued at the old official price of $42.22 per ounce. That's the price reflected in the gold stock listings by the Treasury and Federal Reserve balance sheets, which I discussed last month. But watch for the non-existent gold reserves to be revalued at current market prices. In terms of dollars, our fictitious gold reserves will suddenly look 15 or 20 times bigger. The plan is also to capitalize on talk in Congress about returning to the gold standard. First the controlled major media will publicize talk about the gold standard idea. Then will come the spectacular gold revaluation publicity stunt. Finally, any return to a true gold standard will quietly be squashed because we don't really have all that gold. Instead, they are trying to devise some trick which will require only a token amount of gold. What that will be has not yet been decided, but the net result will be powerful propaganda to impress people to believe the big lie about America's alleged giant gold hoard. My friends, many people would rather put their head in the sand about our missing gold. They would rather not know the awful truth. That is exactly why the big lie will work with so many people. 
but that is like having cancer and not wanting to be told about it, because the United States dollar has terminal cancer, and it will die soon if the truth about our missing gold remains hidden. Sometimes my enemies argue that the truth about our missing gold should not be revealed. According to their argument, exposure of the truth about our missing gold will itself bring down our economy. But, my friends, that argument says that a lie is better than the truth, and it is wrong, dead wrong, and here's why. If the scandal of America's missing gold breaks into the open, it can well set the stage for international action to prevent disaster. There could be an immediate International Monetary Conference to resolve the crisis. The hidden power of the Bolsheviks here, who are bent on disaster, would be broken by the gold scandal, so the conference could put an end to the disastrous system of floating currencies now in effect. Instead, they could establish a new system of fixed yet flexible rates of exchange which would be stable. At the same time, the conference should fix interest rates on an international basis. That would tend to stop the worldwide interest rate war now going on to attract hot money from one country to another. With the pressure off interest rates, inflation could be controlled and industry could revive. Inflation is international in scope, and because the gold scandal here is international in scope, it could be investigated on an international basis. There would be a real chance of tracking down our gold and tracking down the people who have done this to us. Meanwhile, there could be a kind of Marshall Plan in reverse to save the United States dollar. To tide us over the crisis, foreign central banks could lend us some gold for international transactions. Why should they bother to do that, you ask? Very simple. Our trading partners have hundreds of billions of dollars in their hands. If the dollar goes, so do their own economies. So it is in their own self-interest to take international action to save the dollar. But, my friends, all that can happen only, and I repeat only, if the gold scandal breaks before the coming bank crash, because that is the only way to set our monetary affairs free of the grasp of the Bolsheviks here. If they can keep the gold scandal under cover for just a little longer, they will get their way. They will win, and, my friends, you and I will lose everything. Topic No. 3. Several months ago there were big headlines about a supposed new American secret weapon. It's called a stealth plane. The weapon which is actually involved is a specialized hybrid machine called a subcraft. It's the same weapon that I made public two years earlier in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, and early this year, January 1980, the Bolsheviks here tried to use it against Russia. The result was a disaster, as I reported in AUDIO LETTERS No. 53 and 54. So now the spectacular-sounding stealth plane has become just a publicity tool to make nuclear war sound less suicidal. To judge by all the recent publicity, one would think that stealth is a radical new concept in warfare, but stealth, trickery, deception, and surprise have been the prime ingredients in military strategy since ancient times, and today, my friends, we live in an age of stealth, stealth in politics, stealth in economics, and above all, stealth in weaponry in warfare. During the past six years or so, I have made public many secret developments in weapons and warfare. I have revealed the secrets of both Russia and the United States because I believe you need to know, and knowledge is power. 
A secret war is raging right now, and already you and I are suffering the consequences, and if it is not stopped, it will soon explode into all-out thermonuclear war. There is only one way to stop the deadly cycle of war now underway. That way is to put an end to stealth and trickery and replace it with the truth. The truth about America's gold scandal. The truth about stealing of elections with unregulated voting machines. And the truth about a whole new age of secret weapons which are unknown to the public. The new age of stealth in warfare is everywhere today. It makes up a complete spectrum from deep beneath the sea to outer space. To begin with, consider submarines. From the very beginning submarines have always been weapons of stealth. Their outstanding advantage has always been their ability to escape detection. The modern age of nuclear submarines was inaugurated by the United States in 1954, and it was America that conceived a ballistic missile submarine first launched in 1959. Today our leaders still reassure us that American submarines remain second to none. They have to admit that Russia has several times more subs than we do, but they gloss over that with stories that Russian subs are noisy or leaky or their crews are not very smart. So in effect they tell us, don't worry, we can handle a submarine war with Russia. There was a time when quality was in our favor, but that time is long gone. Today the United States is losing badly in the secret war to control the world's oceans. New generations of Russian submarines are entering a new era of their own. For example, there are the new Oscar-class cruise missile submarines. These can launch cruise missiles to attack our aircraft carriers and other surface ships. They can do this while still submerged far beyond the horizon. And there are the new Alpha-class attack submarines, which are without parallel in the world. Submariners always say that a submarine's worst enemy is another submarine, and Russia's new Alpha subs are the worst enemy yet to our subs. Unlike the United States, Russia has mastered the use of titanium for submarine construction, and unlike America, Russia has big supplies of titanium for use in all kinds of new technologies and Russia no longer sells titanium to the United States. So the new Alpha subs have double hulls of titanium, and they are now the deepest diving, fastest operational submarines on Earth. Its speed has been estimated in the West at 45 knots, but my friends, it is actually well over 60 knots. In most situations it can actually outrun America's best torpedo, the Mark 48, and it can dive almost a mile deep to escape attack and slip away under complex ocean currents. But the biggest shock so far in Russia's submarine program took place earlier this fall of 1980. It's a submarine launched from a shipyard near Archangel on the White Sea. When Western Intelligence officials got their first look at it, they could hardly believe their eyes. Traditionally, submarines have been known as boats rather than ships because of their relative smallness, but not this submarine. It's a giant, a ballistic missile submarine about the size of an American World War II aircraft carrier. Western Intelligence officials are mystified as to why it is so large but I can reveal the reason to you right now. The giant new Russian submarine, codenamed Typhoon, is another first. It's the world's first ballistic missile submarine with a reload capability. It can empty all 20 of its ballistic missile tubes at a target in war. Then it can reload the tubes 
with 20 more missiles carried aboard. So if need be, Russia's Typhoon sub can mount two nuclear attacks. Like the Alpha subs, Russia's awesome new Typhoon has a titanium hull. It's not as fast as the sleek Alpha sub, but very fast even so, and it can dive extremely deep. Meanwhile, what does the United States have to answer all that? The answer is America's new Trident missile sub. It carries 24 missiles compared to the Typhoon's 40. It's slower and cannot dive nearly as deep with its non-titanium hull, and it's also three years behind schedule and still slipping. And there are several reasons for that, some of which have been mentioned in the news lately. But one major reason for our crumbling Trident submarine program is not in the news. It's the widespread use of narcotics among Trident shipyard workers. Many workers are not involved, but many are, and as a result there is a tremendous turnover in personnel. Another result is defective welds and mistakes in critical piping. When the mistakes are found, they have to be done over, sometimes more than once, and my friends, absolutely nothing is being done about it. The other side of the coin in undersea warfare is Anti-Submarine Warfare or ASW. Lately we have heard brave stories that there have recently been ASW breakthroughs by the United States. These are based on extremely complex computerized sonar listening networks. But as I first revealed some time ago, all new Russian submarines produce artificial noises in normal operation. That's why the new Alpha subs are thought to be so noisy. The noise is deliberate. When war comes, the noisemakers called cavitators will be retracted. The American sonar nets will listen in vain for the familiar noises. Instead, Alpha subs and others will swim at high speed toward America, whisper quiet. And as they do so, the Russian subs will strike as submarines always strike by stealth. The true condition of America's anti-submarine warfare was summed up in the New York Times last month on October 5. A senior American naval officer was quoted as saying, To find a submarine you need to know where to look, otherwise you'll have to use a large share of your anti-submarine resources just to find and kill one submarine, and in wartime that is not practical. You're better off waiting for him to attack." Unquote. He explained that then we could more easily detect the sub, but he added that a ballistic missile sub could fire its missiles before being caught, quote, so it probably doesn't matter. Unquote. My friends, it would still be a standoff in submarines if Russia had the same problem we do in finding subs, but they don't. Five years ago in 1975, the head of the Russian Navy announced a breakthrough in ASW, and it was not a bluff. He was talking about Psychoenergetic Range Finding, or PRF. I first reported on Russia's PRF in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. It was the key to Russia's destruction of American subcraft early this year, and Russian manned space satellites use PRF to keep track continuously on all United States submarines. When war comes, the positions of our own submarines will be relayed to Russian attack submarines. This will be done by means of the Worldwide Submarine Communication System, which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 16. Russian attack submarines, including the new Alphas, will be vectored in toward our own ballistic missile subs. Our own subs, older and slower, will be caught by surprise and unable to escape. And without warning, Russian nuclear torpedoes will destroy our ballistic missile submarines. When I mentioned Russia's worldwide submarine communication system in AUDIO LETTER No. 16, 
a crisis was underway. It was the underwater missile crisis of 1976. At that time the Russian Navy was planting underwater missiles within our own territorial waters, and they were using submarines to do it. The missiles involved were small, short-range missiles with nuclear warheads. Once planted, these missiles can be launched from their own underwater resting places by satellite command, and they were planted very close to their coastal targets. The result would be zero warning time for an underwater missile attack. The missiles were planted in bays and coves along America's shoreline by a special type of submarine. This was the Missile Planting Mini-Sub which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 16. I mentioned in that tape that, quote, these special submarines are very difficult for our undersea sonar detection nets to pick up because the hull is treated in such a way that it absorbs sonar signals instead of reflecting them." Unquote. Four years later we hear an echo of this concept in the so-called stealth plane. For aircraft the treatment is to absorb radar instead of sonar, but otherwise it's the same idea. Russia was planting underwater missiles along our shores by stealth and our own leaders were responding with equal secrecy instead of warning you. When I made these things public over four years ago, certain newsletter writers and others went into a frenzy. For whatever reason, they did their best to tell their readers not to listen about the missiles. They tried to say that waterproof missiles lurking underwater are impossible. Likewise, they pooh-poohed the very idea of sonar absorbing submarines. But today we are four years closer to NUCLEAR WAR ONE, and the closer catastrophe looms over us, the more it casts its shadow. The New York Times article of last month, which I mentioned earlier, is a good example. It mentioned, quote, Soviet subs are usually coded with a material that absorbed sonar impulses." Unquote. And as for the underwater missiles, listen to some words from a recent letter to the Editor. It was published on September 25, 1980 in the Washington Star. The writer is Captain John E. Drame, formerly Program Manager of the Navy's Project Hydra. He says, quote, we can easily waterproof missiles such as MX and launch them from a vertical floating position. The United States Navy's Project Hydra demonstrated this launch technique with test missiles of ICBM size in the early 1960s." Unquote. And a further quote, a Hydra-type missile can also be floated up from a submerged submarine to the surface and launched from there, the technique used for Soviet SLBMs." Unquote. In light of these words recently published, what I first reported in the summer of 1976 becomes almost routine. The things I reported then were well known to be feasible in intelligence circles, but out of the sheer ignorance, if nothing else, Certain newsletters and organizations wanted people to ignore my warnings. Fortunately, large numbers of my listeners did not ignore those warnings. They applied heavy pressure to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as I suggested, and action was taken for a while to defuse the crisis. In the letter to the Editor I just quoted by Captain Dream, the reference to ICBM sized missiles is interesting because a few months after I reported on Russia's underwater missiles, I learned about our own. America's underwater missiles are radically different from those of Russia. I first revealed them in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977. Unlike the Russian missiles, which are small, America's underwater missiles are huge. They are giant waterproofed ICBMs deployed on the ocean floor but they share one thing in common with those of Russia. 
America's secret fleet of underwater missiles were deployed by stealth. It was done in a super-secret operation known as Operation Desktop, and in the spring of 1978 Operation Desktop was reactivated off America's east coast. America's secret government told you nothing about these hush-hush preparations for war. Instead, they said they were drilling for oil. The Baltimore Canyon area of the Continental Shelf was publicized as if it were an underwater Alaska full of oil, but before the alleged oil drilling even began, I told my listeners not to expect any oil bonanza because they were planting missiles, not searching for oil, and sure enough, after the missiles were planted, we were told it was all a big flop. No oil of importance had been found. These are some of the things going on under the seas of the world, but if we look up instead of down, the pace of stealth warfare is no less frantic. For example, we've heard recently about the so-called stealth technique for evading radar. America's cruise missile is actually a stealth weapon intended to sneak into Russia underneath radar. But ever since radar was invented by the British in World War II, countermeasures against it have been of interest. It started with the dropping of metallic chaff into the air by attacking bombers. That blinded the crude radar of those days. Then the radars were improved to see through the chaff. So next came Electronic Countermeasures, or ECM. ECM gadgets create radar waves of their own in such a way as to cancel out radar reflections off the plane. Using ECM, a 10-foot missile can be made to look like a small bird on radar, and that was accomplished long ago by the mid-60s. Now we are suddenly hearing about radar-absorbent coatings and rounded surfaces. Rounded surfaces tend to diffuse radar waves instead of bouncing them back to the radar antenna. That makes an aircraft hard to detect until it gets very close. My friends, those techniques can be applied to some extent to airplanes, but they are made to order for another type of machine in the air above us. Rounded surfaces diffuse radar, and the ultimate in a rounded surface is a sphere. As a result, Russia's electrogravitic weapons platforms, the Cosmospheres, are natural stealth weapons. I first revealed Russia's deployment of Cosmospheres in late 1977 in AUDIO LETTER No. 29. The first few were used in an attempt at intimidation by Russia. They created giant rumbling air booms along our east coast and elsewhere, but later as more Cosmospheres were deployed, they shifted to a stealth mode of operation. Normally, Cosmospheres on patrol overhead hover at an altitude of around 100 miles. At that height they are invisible to all normal radar, but on several occasions the Russians have wanted the Cosmospheres to show up on American radar. It's one way to send a message in a crisis, and so in tense conditions the Cosmospheres are sometimes ordered to descend to low altitudes. Low for a Cosmosphere usually means from 5 to 7 miles up. As they descend they come closer and closer to ground-based radar. As a result, they gradually become visible on radar as they near the ground. If the Cosmospheres are ordered to descend rapidly, the effect on radar is very dramatic. One minute our radar shows nothing. The next minute blips appear all over the screen. The Cosmosphere blips seem to materialize out of nowhere. I first reported low-altitude threats by Cosmospheres as long ago as AUDIO LETTERS No. 30 and 32, and they have happened again several times since then. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 I also reported that Russia has a smaller fleet of second-generation Cosmospheres. These can hover like all Cosmospheres, but their greatest advantage is speed. They are stripped of weapons and operate as high-speed transports just above the atmosphere. If need be, they can accelerate all the way to orbital speed, 
and operating far above the earth as they do, they are invisible to radar. At least twice in the past year the Russians have made use of their high-speed Cosmospheres for satellite snatching. The first occasion was almost a year ago on December 11, 1979. It was an American satellite called SATCOM-3 made by RCA. It had been in orbit for five days without trouble, but suddenly it just disappeared from radar screens and stopped communicating. That was the last we ever heard from SATCOM-3. A Russian high-speed Cosmosphere had cruised up and matched orbits with it. Then the Cosmosphere cargo bay was opened and SATCOM-3 was pulled inside. When the door was closed it cut off the signal of SATCOM-3, and as it was gobbled up by the radar invisible Cosmosphere, SATCOM-3 seemed to disappear. Last May 9, 1980, it happened again. That time it was a Japanese satellite called Agami-2. Like SATCOM-3, it just seemed to disappear without a trace. Russia was sending a message to Japan not to play too cozy with America's secret war buildup. When it comes to stealth in space, the Russians are old hands. About three months ago on September 1, 1980, a fascinating letter was printed in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. It was written by A. L. Jones, the Director of the Sohio Radio Satellite Tracking Station from 1958 to 1964. He said, quote, The technology for making aircraft invisible to radar detection is neither new nor is it proprietary with the United States military. In midsummer of 1962 the Soviet Union made a public announcement that it was launching a Cosmos Earth orbiting satellite which would be invisible to radar detection. The satellite was successfully launched and it carried on board a radio transmitter which could be used to confirm that it was in orbit." Unquote. He mentions that NORAD requested radio tracking data from the Sohio Station and continues Quote, Normally radio tracking data is not needed by NORAD unless radar and optical methods prove ineffective. Apparently this was the case. After approximately two months the radio transmitter in the satellite ceased to operate and the space vehicle became invisible to all methods of tracking." Unquote. My friends, for more than three years now Russia has controlled the military use of space. Russia now has many satellites, including manned satellites, which are not even being tracked in the West. For this and other reasons, America's military plight has become untenable, and yet the Bolsheviks here are still bent on nuclear war against Russia. They believe they will survive, as I explained in AUDIO LETTERS 56 and 57 but they don't care how many of the rest of us suffer and die. One way or another they are determined to set off an American nuclear first strike against Russia. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 last June I revealed one of the keystones of Bolshevik nuclear war planning. It is America's secret mobile missile, the Minuteman TX, the Traveling Minuteman. TX missiles are already deployed along existing railroad tracks in our northern states. Meanwhile, the elaborate publicity cover-up for the Minuteman TX program is continuing. This includes controversy over the alleged MX missile, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 55. And now it also includes stories about a possible speed-up of the mobile missile program. On November 18, the New York Times reported that this could include, and I quote, making some Minuteman missiles mobile, unquote. As usual, the news is far behind the facts. I can report that the initial deployment of Minuteman TX missiles is now virtually completed. Now a second phase is underway. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I describe the special mobile launch car that carries each Minuteman TX. Now one by one each TX car is being joined by a second car. On the outside it looks just like the TX car, 
but the missile inside is totally different. The missile in the second car is an Anti-Cosmosphere Missile or ACM, and it is armed with a Cobalt Ionization Bomb, which I first described in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I described the launch sequence that is being planned for the TX missiles, but now something extra will also be taking place. When the order comes to launch the TX missiles, the ACM will go into action first. Without waiting to slow down, the cover will be blasted off the ACM railroad car. That will expose the ACM missile itself resting on its launcher. The ACM is far smaller than the Minuteman, and its launcher is angled upward slightly, so the moment the cover flies off, the ACM will be launched. When the ACM takes off, it will accelerate with 100 times the force of gravity. Less than one second after launch, the ACM will be traveling more than 1,000 miles per hour, and because it takes off almost horizontally, it will be an impossible target for the Cosmosphere overhead to aim at. Less than 10 seconds after launch, the Cobalt Ionization Bomb will explode in the upper atmosphere. That is supposed to disable the Cosmospheres briefly, as I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, and with the Cosmospheres neutralized, the Minuteman TX missiles themselves will be launched at Russia. At least that is the plan of the Bolsheviks here. The Cosmosphere crews have already been given orders intended to nullify the plan. When the ACM is launched, they will not even try to shoot at it. Instead, they will start firing their charged particle beam weapons at the Minuteman TX railroad car. They will have about 10 seconds to destroy it before the Cobalt Ionization Bombs explode, and that should be more than enough time to vaporize every TX and its locomotive. But by that time the Kamikaze nuclear first strike against Russia may be impossible to stop, and if it is, the consequences for America will be total destruction. Stealth and secrecy will end in complete disaster. My friends, I have nothing more to add at this time as a last-minute summary. I hope to record my next AUDIO LETTER No. 61 around mid-January 1981. Until then, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holy New Year. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.